I'd like to look at this, two different accounts of this one event here in Matthew chapter 14, and then we'll go over to Mark chapter 6, where it says that Jesus had compassion on the people. Amen. But Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 and 14, we'll take our text from, it says, but when Jesus heard of it, that is, when he had heard about John the Baptist being beheaded, and then Herod and others saying that Jesus must be John the Baptist raised from the dead. His disciples came and told him in verse 12. It says, when Jesus heard of it, he departed thence, that's from, from Nazareth, by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. It said Jesus had heard of the news, and knowing that his time was not yet, he left from Nazareth. We go back to the previous chapter, it tells us that he was in his own country, which was Nazareth and Galilee. So he went from there, and it says he took a ship and departed to a desert place. Now this desert place, according to Luke's gospel, was outside the city of Bethsaida, which if you know was a city that was at Peter and Andrew and Philip, or excuse me, and Philip, they were all from that area. But it says in verse 12, the 13 here, they went out but the people, when they had heard, therefore they followed him out on foot out of the cities. They Amen. followed him to where he went to. And I think some others came out of the cities that were around there. Uh, as we'll see over in Mark's gospel, they, Jesus and, had told the disciples they would go over there so they could get some rest. But the people decided to follow after them anyway. But let's notice in verse 14 where I really like to look at. And when and Jesus went forth, and as he went forth out of the ship, and saw a great multitude, and was moved with compassion toward them. Well, this multitude that had followed and come out of the cities, came out of the ship and saw them waiting for him and the disciples, and said he was moved with compassion toward them. Amen. That's one thing it seems that we as Sovereign Grace Baptists Forget about us. You're right. Compassion. Yes. Are we ever moved with compassion? Mm. I, I know many Christians they are. I don't even know if they know how to define the word compassion. Right. Oh, it's really sympathy or pity would be synonyms. Looking on a person and having you know, care for them. Well, there, there's a reason the world accuses us of being judgmentalists because oftentimes that's how we put on. Now, you know, we should still call sin for what it is. We should still preach the truth. But we can do that with compassion. Amen. It says that Jesus came out and saw the multitude and he was moved with this compassion. He said, I don't think we are too often moved with compassion. You're right. Are we ever really you know, desirous to see? I think, as Brother Junior was talking about, are we ever just really have a desire to pray for others or to see souls saved or to see that their needs are taken care of? Even let's go over to First John for just a moment. First John chapter three. Second, First John, chapter three, and verse seventeen. You know, he just told us that the world will hate us, but we are to love the brethren. And then, mm -hmm. verse 
17, he says, But whoso hath this world's goods, and seeth his brother have need, and showeth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Right. Well, I know I don't think any of us are exactly rich here, but if we see a brother in need and we can help them out, he says, we ought to help them. Mm -hmm. That's it. But we're not displaying the love of God if we don't. That's right. Amen. Well, here he says, if you see him, his brother had need, shows up his bowels of compassion. That's the exact opposite of what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to look at him and say, well, he'll be all right. Mm -hmm. Especially a brother or sister in Christ. Mm -hmm. Compare this with James. Let's turn over this one to James chapter 2. And here, James is speaking about how that faith is dead without works, but he uses this illustration in chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. He says, If a brother or sister be naked, destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warm and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things that are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Amen. Does it do any good to see someone who is going hungry or has needs and say, well, I wish you the best? <laughs> right. It really doesn't do any good, does it? Mm -hmm. But we ought not to, as John said, shut up our bowels of compassion. We ought to have this compassion and care for others. Amen. Not just say, well, I hope it all works out or something like that. Now, there is a difference between those who have need and those who just don't want to do anything. I mean, Paul himself said, and he will not eat, or he will not work, neither shall he eat. Right. But at the same time, we see others in need, we ought to do our best to take care of that. Mm -hmm. Amen. No, telling them, well, be warm and filled does not do them any good. That's it. That doesn't display the love of God, the compassion which Christ displayed over and over again. You know, this event we're looking at here is just one of several times that Christ showed compassion on others. It doesn't, doesn't do any good to just say with words, does it? No, no, I don't. In fact, over there, back in First John, I think in the next verse or two, it says, not to love in word only, but in deed and in truth. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but... We cannot have this true godly love in name only, if you will. We can't just say we love someone, or we can't say, say we care about someone and never do anything at all. That's it. Amen. You know. so going back to our text here in Matthew, where it says that he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. I don't think we can heal the sick like Christ did. Yeah. But we certainly can pray for them, can we? Amen. So we are to pray for the sick among us that they, especially if they request it, like Brother Junior did. James chapter 5 lays us out very plainly. Mm -hmm. Amen. But we can still pray for others outside the church as well. So we have our prayer request at the end of the services, but do we actually take those requests and pray about them? Yeah. I mean, it does not, doesn't do much good to say, well, pray for this person, and that's the end of it. Right. That's about the equivalent of being warm and filled. <laughs> no, we ought to be a prayer for people. In fact, over there in James 5, it says, the effectual prayer of prayer for righteous men availeth much. Amen. You know, I don't think that we have some special power, but we ought to be a prayer for people because God has the power. You know, we certainly ought to pray to the one who can heal them, whether it's members of the church, other members of other churches, or loved ones, or friends, acquaintances. If we truly have this compassion, we ought to pray for them. Amen. 
both for their physical needs, but even more for their spiritual needs. You know, he, Christ was so moved with compassion, he just touched them and they were healed. Spoke yeah. the word and they were healed. So I, I think we can all here would agree that doctors are useful, but they are only useful as God allows. They can only do as much as God will give them the ability to do. Amen. You might say they are just simply tools in His hand, aren't they? Well, I know some, they, they give all the credit to the doctors when they're healed. Hmm. <clears throat> Thanks be to God for good doctors, but oh, how we ought to thank God for His work and everything. You're right. Yeah. I think God can use doctors, and I think He can just miraculously heal them. I think we all here are seeing both. Mm -hmm. Amen. When I think about COVID, it's a well, that's about everybody except for me and my family have had it. I thank God for that, but maybe He has a different plan for me. I don't know. Right. I don't want to get into politics, but. COVID certainly is a real thing, but, but I don't think it's something that we ought to fear as much as the government tells us we ought to. You're right. I just looked up the CDC numbers, and, and last year, 2020, twice as many people died of heart disease. There you go. And uh, about 150,000 more died of cancer. But yet we don't freak out and shut everything down for these, do we? There you go. Like I said, I, I don't think COVID's something we should just say, oh, that's fake. But yet, people have been sick and dying for centuries, millennials now. Mm -hmm. It hasn't, it's been ever since the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden that death has been around, that sicknesses came in this world. So, COVID is nothing new that ought to scare us to death. Like, yeah, man. Yeah. And we ought to have compassion on those who have it. We ought to have compassion on those who have other sicknesses and diseases. I'm not saying we need to open up some healing ministry or whatever you want to call it, like some of these churches. Right. But yet, prayer ought to be one of our ministries, if you will. Amen. Sure. Well, let's go over to Mark's account of this now, though. In Mark chapter 6, he goes with a different perspective. Luke records or mentions both of these things, so. There's no discrepancy there. Just Mark records it from one perspective and Matthew from a different one. Mark chapter 6, verses 30 through 34. Here we have the same events. John the Baptist just been beheaded and news came to Jesus. So the disciples have been out, I think, healing the sick and casting out devils. And they come back to him at this point. Verse 30 and says, And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told them all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while, for there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. And the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither, thither out of all the cities, or of all the cities, and out went them, and came together unto him. And Jesus, when he had saw, or excuse me, Jesus, when he had came out and saw much people, and was moved with compassion toward them, because they were as sheep not having a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. Amen. See, much of the details are the same here, but we see a few differences. The one he he told the disciples they were to go over here and rest a while. Even though they got there, there's still a bunch of people there. So, <clears throat> if you know, if you remember the rest, if we read this, maybe from John's account in the life of Philip, but they were ready to send people away. It's not his word. As it mentions here, they hadn't even had so much as to eat. Then he tells them, well, we're going to feed these 5,000 people first. That's just a, something to give you something to think about this week. Amen. But here he's, they came to this place, and the people were waiting, and he came out, and he says he had compassion toward them. 
because they were a sheep not having a shepherd. Well, this world has a sheep not having a shepherd, isn't it? Amen. Even many professing Christians are like sheep not having a shepherd. They're just wandering about from here to there, not having any sense of direction. That's what sheep do without the shepherd. Amen. They possibly even wander into harm's way or Without the shepherd, the wolves can come and devour them. But Christ had compassion on them. He didn't say, well, they get what they deserve. Mm -hmm. Say, well, they're just a bunch of heretics. No, it says he had compassion on them and taught them many things. Amen. Well, when we see people in messed up in false doctrines or Going after the ways of the world, we should we should have compassion towards them. Mm -hmm. Most likely, they've never been taught the truth. You're right. I'm sure they've, they've heard of Christ. I don't think there's too many people in. I know there's some now. You know, blow their mind. There's most people have heard of Christ and know mm -hmm. of God at least. But many, many don't know about the God of the Bible. Amen. They don't know about. The Jesus of the scriptures. But even these here, they didn't have a right understanding. If you remember back in it, Hosea had prophesied that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Right. Mm -hmm. It hadn't gotten any better by the time of Christ. In fact, the scribes and the Pharisees, as supposed to religious elite and leaders of the day, they were supposed to know everything. Christ said that they were blind guides. Amen. Matthew 23. <laughs> then in Matthew 15, 14, he says that they were blind leaders of the blind. Mm -hmm. He said, can a blind lead the blind? Except they fall into a ditch. Right. No, you, the lost are never going to teach people about the truth of the Word of God. That was left up to us, wasn't it? Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 9 just a moment. This same little terminology is used here. Matthew 9, 36. Who after he had cast out the devil out of someone, it says that verse 32, as they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with the devil. The devil was cast out, the dumb man spake, and the multitude marvel, saying, It was never so seen in Israel. If we go on down to verse 36, Christ was going about preaching and healing and casting out devils, and it says, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Amen. So they fainted. They were exhausted, if you will. They were tired. They were weary. That's what the ways of the world will lead you. It'll tire you out. Amen. When you're tossed <laughs> to and fro, and one moment, one moment you're believing this, the next you got to believe this, or one moment, one moment you got to be afraid of President Trump, and the next you got to be afraid of COVID. Mm -hmm. Whatever it may be, the media is good at that. It gets exhausting. I can tell you, I, I don't pay much attention to news anymore, and I have a lot less to worry about. Amen. In fact, some people will tell me something, oh, I didn't even know that happened. <laughs> there you go. It didn't affect me at all, but yet we're over here worrying about it. Mm -hmm. No sheep without a shepherd is not a good thing, is it? That's yet right. that's the state of our society, it's the state of really the, most of the world. They're just wandering about, looking, and having no word, having no sense of where to go. So the natural man will not find his way to God. Amen. He finds his way to everything else first, doesn't he? The sheep don't find their way back to the pasture very often, do they? Mm -hmm. well, they wander about, they usually end up hurting themselves somewhere, or getting stuck somewhere, or getting killed by a predator. We shouldn't, as God's people say, well, 
That's the way they're going to get it. You know, we ought to, as Christ, to have compassion on them. Amen. In fact, really, we are to be the ones who teach them the truth, aren't we? Amen. Is that not part of the Great Commission? The devil is certainly not going to teach them the truth. The, the world is not going to teach them the truth. Right. And reason and logic isn't going to lead them to the truth of God's word either. Amen. But at the same token, we can't shove it down their throats like some of us want to. And certainly, I think we ought to preach. We ought to, like I said, call sin for what it is. We ought to Amen. Tell unashamedly about who God is. So we don't have to do that in a way that's always condescending to others, do we? Though? We don't have to say, well, this is the way it's going to be. And, well, if you don't like it, you're going to hell. That's the way some people preach today. Right. Certainly, there probably are, on, even though they don't know Christ, there are on their way to hell. But it's not because they don't believe just like you do. It's because they don't know Christ as Savior. Amen. Oh, we ought to have this compassion as Christ did, him being our great example. Well, we are not greater than the Master. That was what Christ himself said. The servant is not greater than the Master. Amen. If it was good enough for Christ to do it that way, it should be for us as well. well we are called to be the light of the world, aren't we? Yeah. Amen. Yet the world is whole world lies in darkness, John said in first John. We ought to be the light shining unto them. We ought to be going to the whole world. I know we can't physically all go to the whole world, but certainly we can preach and teach the truth here. Certainly we can send it out over the internet. We can support missionaries. Amen. How we ought to be doing our best to share the gospel to the whole world. Otherwise, they're going to be just a sheep without a shepherd wandering here and there. You know, I mentioned before, I see all sorts of false teachings sent out in the mail to people. Usually, mostly the older people get the mail, but I've seen everything from Joel Osteen to <laughs> Catholic Church and everything in between. Right. And the Jehovah's Witnesses, they're big on that too. Or how we ought to have as much zeal to share the truth as these people do. Or as, I'd say, as much zeal as they do to share their false doctrines. Right. I just want to give us one more thought and we'll close up. Really, we talk about compassion and love and whatnot, and that we can't go so far the other way that that's all we are is love and everything else. We, but 1 Corinthians chapter 13 tells us without charity we are nothing. That's it. Uh, really, charity is sometimes described as love and action or benevolence. It's compassion will result in charity. Mm -hmm. right, let's, let's turn there. We'll read the first couple of verses. We won't read the whole chapter. First Corinthians 13, verse 1 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I have become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Amen. You might could speak all these marvelous languages, and you might be able to speak them well, but he says, if you don't have charity, you're just, you're just basically making noise. That's about all you're useful for. Verse 2 says, and Though I had to give the prophecy, and understand all mysteries, and have or, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. Mm -hmm. Except prophecy, if that's where they want to take it as the Old Testament prophets, that, or just as preaching either which way, if you have that gift and still you have, don't have charity, he says you're nothing. Mm -hmm. says, and understand all mysteries. I don't understand all mysteries, I don't know if any of y'all do. Mm -hmm. There's a whole lot of mysteries of the Word of God that I don't understand. So you can understand all that if you don't have charity or nothing. Right. 
in all knowledge. You can know all about the Bible front to back. Know all about the things of God. And yet, without charity, he says you are nothing. Amen. This last one oh, almost surprises me. He says, though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains. That's a great amount of faith, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I, I certainly don't have that amount of faith. I, I believe God is able, but I don't. I doubt him many times. Mm -hmm. I have to say, as the one did in the Gospels, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. But he said you can have all that faith, and yet if you don't have charity, you're nothing. In verse 3, he says, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Amen. You can give all your stuff to the poor, but as Christ taught in the gospel, if you don't do it for the right reasons, you're like the hypocrites that want to be seen. If you're not doing it out of charity, then it profits you nothing. You know, you can do things your own way, but writing it off on your taxes doesn't seem like a real act of charity, does it? Mm. Then he says, and I, though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it probably be nothing. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's talking about cremation here, but though you give your body to be martyred, if you will, but mm -hmm. like polycarp burned at the stake, you know, if you give yourself to that, if you don't have charity, he says it's, it's no use. Mm -hmm. So there were a time in the early church when some people were purposely trying to be martyred but they might gain fame. Mm. It was thought as a, a good thing, which you might gain some favor with God. That's not doing out of charity. Right. You know, I certainly don't desire to give my body to be burned, but I hope that if God calls me to suffer through something that I will yield to his will and he'll give me the grace to go through it. Amen. But if we're doing it to gain a name for ourselves, it profits us nothing. So I think if you could go through the Martyrs Mirror or the Fox Book of Martyrs and talk to most of those men, they would say not to remember them and what they did. Right. But then they ought to say, same thing we ought to say in everything, to look at Christ and what he has done. That ought to be our message, and we ought to have it with the same type of compassion that Christ had. Amen. So, the old saying, you win more, you'll catch more flies of honey than vinegar. Right. So you'll, you'll win more people, if you will. You'll be more effective by having compassion and by being you know, hateful and spreading the truth. Yeah. You know, I'm afraid many have gotten that reputation, at least. Mm -hmm. you know, we're almost hateful in the way we present ourselves. Right. Well, let's have compassion, as Jude said, on some having compassion make a difference. Amen. Let's close that thought.